Welcome everyone to Gamer Melt. Today I've got a ton of news, so I figured this would likely be the best way to do it. Also, I've had the thing that shall not be named, and it's just pretty tiring. Anyway, there's a lot of news today. Starting with Intel's 11th gen specs confirmed, AMD announced their full Ryzen 5000 mobile series, Ryzen 5000 mobile availability, Intel's 7 nanometer discrete GPU, and Intel's first desktop discrete GPU is here, but AMD CPUs won't work with it. Okay, first up for today, we have the full specs of Intel's upcoming 11th gen CPUs. As you can see, this actually comes from MSI, and at least according to video cards, this is still under NDA, so we aren't actually supposed to get the full specs, but here they are. First up, we have the i5-11600K, which is a 6-core, 12-thread CPU with a base clock of 3.9 gigahertz and a boost of 4.9. You can also see that it comes with 12 megabytes of L3 cache, and once again, it's a 6-core, 12-thread CPU that supports up to 3200 DDR4. Next up, we have the i7-11700K, which is obviously an 8-core, 16-thread CPU with a 3.6 GHz base clock and once again, 4.9 GHz boost. Although, actually, the, you know, Technology 3.0 frequency boost does get it up to 5 GHz. This one comes with 16 megabytes of L3 cache, and of course, all of these support up to 3200 DDR4. And finally, we have the 11900K, which, unfortunately, as we've already basically confirmed 100 times over, it is still an 8-core, 16-thread CPU, so Intel, once again, with their 11th gen, is going backwards. You can see here that we actually have the uh, 10th gen, that obviously is a 10 core CPU, but this one has a base clock of 3.5 gigahertz, which is pretty odd considering the 10 core and even eight core i7 has a higher base frequency. So this is obviously a bit concerning, but it does get up to 5.3 gigahertz on a single core or an all core boost of 4.8. And it also has 16 megabytes of L3 cache. Once again though, rumors that we've seen so far do suggest that Intel is gonna be releasing their 12th gen in September. Now, I'm not 100% sure if it's a release or if it's just gonna be the announcement, but either way, September seriously makes these seem like they're flat DOA. I mean, dead on arrival. Of course, with all this new hardware coming out, it can get tough to know what to buy. That's why I offer my PC hardware suggestions at kit.co slash gamermail. In it, I go over why you may want to buy one thing over another, from GPUs to CPUs and more, as well as provide tips when buying certain components. And if you have any questions, just leave a comment and I'll try to reply as soon as I can. Plus, when you make a purchase, it helps the channel out at no additional cost to you. So don't wait and visit kit.co slash gamermail or click the link in the description below. And next up for today, AMD has officially announced the Ryzen 5000 mobile processors. Now, if you were like me, you kind of felt that they already did that back at CES, but of course, that was more or less just a tease. They haven't completely announced them until now. And as you can see, these are based on Zen 3. So of course, that is their new process that was first released late last year with the Ryzen 5000 desktop. Anyway, like I said, Zen 3, and one thing that's pretty interesting is that AMD did release quite a bit of performance metrics, though of course, as always, while these are official, it's best to wait for third-party reviews because they always kind of cherry-pick things left and right. Everyone does this, Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, so as always, I do personally suggest you wait for third-party reviews. Anyway, starting things off, we do have the Ryzen 7 5800U. Now, as you can see, it is comparing it to the 1165 G7. Now, the odd thing about this, though I say odd, but this is the absolute competitor um, against the 5800U for pricing and things like that. But keep in mind that Intel's i7 is a four core part, but of course, Intel is the one who decided to uh, have four cores in their top end Ultrabook CPUs, so that's more or less on them. Anyway, you can see that in productivity. So we're looking Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and things like that, which I will say do tend to prefer less cores and higher frequency versus more cores and lower frequencies. So 
This is definitely a pretty decent comparison. And as you can see, thanks to Ryzen 5000 getting a decent boost in single core performance, it's doing very well. And next up, we have web performance. You can see that it, I would argue that it's basically it's high across the board. AMD definitely got a performance boost from Renoir to the point where it makes it on a level playing field with Intel. Next up, we have gaming. This is basically GPU versus GPU or iGPU versus iGPU. And of course, Intel's XE GPUs are fairly impressive. So with the fact that we are seeing them win in three games, though they are losing slightly in these three, they do win by quite a bit over here. Well, okay, League of Legends, that's about it. And of course about 19% uh, here. Not bad at all. Fortnite just barely wins, but also barely loses in these three. And like we've seen with the others, it is a significant performance increase over Renoir. And as, uh, as I had also said, this is primarily going to be the iGPU that's going to be the bottleneck here. So clearly AMD has stepped up their game. And next we have the lower end model, the Ryzen 5 5600U in web browsing compared to the i5 1135G7. And to be honest, it is once again, fairly impressive. Next we have gaming performance versus the 1135G7 wins overall in most games, though it does lose by two. And next we are getting to the high performance processors. You can see that this is the 5900HX versus the i9-10980HK. Now remember that the 10980HK is going to be their 14 nanometer process. And of course the new 5900HX does incredibly well. We can actually see that it got a significant boost once again over Renoir versus the 4900H, and it ends up coming out on top versus the i9. And next we have encoding, and it does fairly well there also. Once again, beating out last gen by quite a bit and ending up to beat out the uh, i9 by even more. And next up for today, Speaking of uh, these new Ryzen 5000 processors, XMG actually put out a post on uh, Reddit about when they're expecting to have these. And I've got to admit that this is really bleak. As you can see right here, they expect to get the RTX 3000 series, which I do think that this is um, kind of telling about that as well. They're looking at getting them early to mid in uh, basically March early March for the 3070, uh, 3080 with the i7, but then with uh, better displays, they're looking at middle to the end of March. So basically the mobile 3000 GPUs likely aren't gonna become readily available until March. Now, unfortunately, this seems to get even worse when we're talking about AMD's Ryzen 5000H processors. You can see right here that the supply forecast literally doesn't say. Now, when we move down, well, really quickly, I will also say that whenever we're looking at the 4800H, that's also saying the end of March. So at least in this scenario, it does look like the thing that's holding it back, just because this is obviously an older Ryzen CPU, the thing that's likely holding it back until March is going to be the RTX 3000 cards. And of course, whatever kind of supply we get with that, there's a chance we may start seeing them in March for the desktop but I'm not 100% sure. Hopefully we'll actually see it at the desktop even sooner just because these are even a newer launch. I don't know, but maybe we will start catching up come February. Anyway, when we go down here, you can see no clear visibility yet on AMD Ryzen 5000H supply. Basically, this is looking like yet another paper launch. Anyway, let's see. Our biggest uncertainty will be around AMD Cezanne CPUs in the first half of this year, meaning he doesn't even know if they're gonna be able to get them in the first half of this year. They go on to say, despite our best efforts to forecast an order very early and despite some excellent R&D that we have done, they have very little visibility into how many AMD Ryzen 5000 series CPUs we will be able to ship to customers in the next three months. Now, obviously that is bad news, though I will say there's a chance that AMD is simply shipping it to um, much bigger laptop makers rather than XMG, because I know that they are a smaller company, but at the same time, I have no doubt that the bigger laptop makers are also having problems ordering as well. 
at the end of the day, it looks like we aren't going to see these really get in stock and really see them on shelves in laptops until probably the second half of this year. And next up for today, Raja Kaduri actually sent out the first die shot of their Intel XE HPC. As you can see, he actually stated that it includes seven advanced silicon technologies in a single package. And of course, though, a lot of guessing can kind of be done as to, you know, what each of these are. But luckily, WCCF Tech actually went through and cross referenced it with more than one source to find out that this is almost certainly it. You can see right here that this includes their Favaro's 3D packaging. Very impressive stuff. It includes HBM2 memory, so not HBM1 like some had originally thought. It also includes uh, their new Rambo cache. You can see that uh, the compute dies are actually built on Intel's 7 nanometer process, while the I.O. tile is built on TSMC 7 nanometers. Basically, this thing is seriously impressive. I do have to admit, we're talking HBM2 memory. They are going all out whenever it comes to their GPUs. And speaking of GPUs and going all out, Intel has finally unveiled, announced, releasing their first discrete desktop GPU. As you can see right here, yes, we actually have pictures of genuine GPUs. Of course, this one right here is passively cooled, which if you wouldn't have guessed, it's not all that powerful. In fact, this is their DG1. Uh, it is based on their Iris XE um, architecture. And whenever we look down here, you can see that it actually has less cores than the Iris XE Max. And for those who don't know, the Iris XE Max is a mobile discrete GPU. So for whatever reason, they're actually putting less cores in their desktop GPU versus their mobile part. And obviously that is odd. I will say that from what I've read, it has a, uh, a, G, a frequency of over 1700 megahertz, which is a bit more than their mobile product, but still we're talking 16 less cores. That is quite a bit of a bummer, but still this is a huge milestone because it's been literally over two decades before Intel tried anything like this. And clearly they're getting very serious. And one of the reasons I know that is because they actually partnered up with some board partners. Specifically, we know it's a Zeus, this right here. Uh, they even admitted that it is a Zeus as one of their board partners. So they're actually teaming up with card makers who are making cards for them. So this is getting very serious. Now, I only mention a Zeus because we know that there is another card maker. And here's the weird part. You can see right here that it was pretty obvious to everyone that this card maker was colorful. I mean, when we look at this design right here and compare it to this one, you can see that they're basically identical, but Colorful themselves have actually come out and stated Colorful would like to clarify that the rumors are not true, meaning Colorful is not launching an Iris XE desktop GPU. Obviously, that is odd given that this one looks identical to it, but whoever it is, Intel is clearly getting serious because they're actually teaming up. With that said, these are unfortunately set for OEM only, so you won't be able to buy these for the DIY market, but we do know pretty well that Intel is gonna be releasing those. It's just likely not gonna be until their DG2 product. And of course, this isn't even all that powerful at all. It's honestly worse than some of the integrated GPUs. So very few gamers or really anyone would have a massive use for this, but it's still really interesting to see Intel following through on what they said. With that said, the final story is very odd. You can see right here that Intel's DG1 graphics card is actually not compatible with either AMD CPUs or older Intel CPUs. Now, I will say I don't think this is a huge deal. I don't think this is going to be something we're going to be seeing with future GPUs, though I don't know. The reason why I say it is just because these are OEM only parts. So from what I would guess, Intel likely just didn't do what it would take to actually have these work across the board. They basically did the bare minimum. Then again, the fact that these just flat will not work on any AMD CPU, this obviously limits OEM partners that want to use this card in an AMD system. 
So it also could be intentional. Really quickly, just to read Intel's statement, it says, please note that the Iris XE add-in card will be paired with 9th gen Coffee Lake S and 10th gen Comet Lake S, Intel Core desktop processors, and Intel B460 H410, B365 H310C chipset-based motherboards and sold as part of pre-built systems. These motherboards require a special BIOS that supports Intel Iris XE, so the cards won't be compatible in other systems. So yeah, that flat out says it. All I can say is that I'm really disappointed. I seriously hope this is not uh, something that we can expect in the future. If it is, I know that the DIY market is really going to push back hard against that. And I really hope you do because that's just flat out absurd. At the end of the day, I will say that I am fairly impressed with Intel moving forward, actually bringing us their first desktop discrete GPU. But at the same time, I'm very apprehensive. Let me know what you think about it down in the comments below. And if you liked the video, please subscribe. I do know uh, that I kind of mumbled a lot and everything. Like I said, not feeling very well. But hopefully you did like it. And as always, have a great day.